Episode 81. I want you. Are you willing? I don't. No. Stefan gazed at her hard as he brushed his harsh and cool lips against hers. You should be clear on your place. She gave him a death glare and retorted, I know very well. You who is not clear. You have a fiancé, yet you keep on coming at me. I'm coming at you. He laughed chillingly. His handsome face was next to hers when he stuck out his tongue to coyly lick her earlobe as he evilly asked again, Woman, who is the one not knowing your place? It's you! Let me go! Don't touch me! She panted with embarrassment and despair at his taunting. Are you hiding something from me? She tried to hide the panic welling up inside her by licking her lips. No. Huh. No. He slowly took out his phone and flashed a picture before her eyes. She saw the image on the phone and her heart sank to the bottom of the pit. It was a photo taken of Andres and Sam at a Ferris wheel in an amusement park. Two were hugging as Andres was innocently smiling at the camera. You! She blurted out her son's name, but quickly clenched her mouth shut. She watched him, terrified. You! He took his time with his words. You had a pair of identical twins six years ago. The doctor said that the younger brother was not breathing when he was born. My assistant then took away the elder brother, and subsequently, the young one vanished. No! The words had finally happened. She found out about the child. Even though she wanted to deny it, the two's blood ties could not be concealed. Andres looked dashing in the photo, certainly following his father's footsteps. No one could deny their father-son relation. Moreover, Andres looked exactly like little Sam. That was the best evidence. Oh God, is he going to take away Andres? Is he going to take Andres away from me? The doctor only said that the younger one was not breathing when he was born. He did not confirm the boy's death. He smiled and asked, Don't you find that fishy, too? She kept me mom and nearly bit her lower lip. Her chest heaved Under the moonlight, one could see glistening tears welling up in her eyes. With a trembling voice, Can't you come away? What? He nabbed at her chin with such force, and the pain caused her tears to well up again. I couldn't bear to let go. We have a contract in place. His eyes formed into a foreboding, thin slit. You violated the contract and tried to conceal this. She turned around slowly. She leaned lifelessly and slipped to the ground. Tears. I'm selfish, I know. Andres is my flesh and blood, after all. I couldn't bear to let him go, so I did it. She timorously confessed. You took away my son and disappeared for six years. Tell me, how should I punish you? She refused to answer, and merely continued to bite her lower lip, a face flushed with agony and embarrassment. Miss Monica, do you remember the pen for when there's a breach of contract? Monica retracted her shoulders as she solemnly replied, if there is a breach of contract regarding the child's custody, the violator will have to pay one billion as monetary penalty. She bit her lower lip hard before saying, Just give me some time. I'll pay the penalty. He crossed his graceful legs as he sat on the sofa and asked casually, Can you really gather one billion just by yourself? Please believe that I'll pay up. Not at all, he coldly said, planning to regain custody of the child. No. She lost her voice as her heart squirmed with sorrow at the thought of losing her son. Please. Please don't take Andres away from me. He's a not to. Tearfully replied. I love him. And he can't bear to leave me too. He pondered for a moment before saying coldly. I won't take him away. She stared disbelievingly at him, not having expected him to agree so easily. But, he hedged, his pair of eyes regarding her more deeply. But, her heart hung in the air. You have to stay by my side. She drew in a sharp breath. Stay by your side? He asked with a smile. Why? What's the matter with that? Sir Lewis, are you joking? 
be my woman. Before she could complete her question, the man tyrannically and coldly cut her off. She looked at him, feeling lost. Under the moonlight, the man leisurely spread himself out on the couch like an ancient king, ruthless, cold-blooded, and domineering. What? His thin lips formed a smile at her startled look, and he asked, I want you. Are you willing? Oh, he's smiling. I think you have no foresight. He jested. Many women are willing to line up from here to Paris just for my attention. Yet you aren't willing to, even when I want you. Aren't you playing hard to get? She sneered inwardly at his words and wiped her tears away. While she was still worried, his taunting somehow calmed her down. Case, why don't you choose from them? He coldly chuckled. You don't know men at all. I... Uh... If you aren't willing, the door is over there. Help yourself out. She was surprised at his words. He's letting me go? You're really letting me go? I'm not imprisoning you. You have your legs. She pondered, lifted her chest high, and told him before heading for the door. I'll pretend this didn't happen. The man quietly added as she turned to leave. The lawyer's letter will be served tomorrow after you walk out of the door. That stopped her in her tracks. She stood rooted to the spot, her spine tensing from shock and fear. This man was undoubtedly serious. Can I win? Can I fight against this family? She was powerless against such a mighty conglomerate. Her eyes fumed with anger, and she turned to him with a stricken face. Despicable! His lips glaringly arched into a deep and provoking smile. He knew her too well. He knew she would be unable to walk out of this door. I will do anything to get what I want. He squinted and said provocatively, Same goes for women. Episode 82 Pickable I can do anything to get what I want. Stefan squinted and added provocatively, The same goes for women. Clenching her fists, Monica bit her lower lip hard as she struggled to come to a decision. Finally, a reply was heard lamely. What do you want me to do? Come over here. He commanded her softly, yet it weighed on her heavily. She drew a sharp breath and took the first step toward him. Her every move was like a step into the abyss. Each step was slow and heavy. Come over here. He frowned in irritation. Her every action seemed heavy as she looked at the man's handsome profile. Before she could react, he caught her wrist with a raise of his arm and pulled her to him. Her vision spun for a second as she fell into his embrace. He used his palm to hold her in place. She was now straddling him in an embarrassing position. Her face burned hot. She tried to resist, but was stopped by a painful pinch on her waist. She glared at him. Sheila. Miss Monica, who is the real shameless one here? He smilingly asked her back. Who stole my son and tried to cover up the truth that got discovered? You owe me a billion, so I am technically your creditor. Pausing for a bit, he eventually continued with a look of mocking intolerance to her ignorance. You owe me money. Is this the attitude you should show to your creditor? I'll pay that one billion. I'll work and definitely pay you back, she solemnly declared, not at all cowed by his threatening words. Let's count the interest for this penalty in the past six years. He shrugged uncaringly as a lazy smile formed on his lips. She stared at him in disbelief, protesting. You mean there's still interest? He arched a brow and looked at her deeply. It's all in the contract. Haven't you read it carefully? She could feel her face burning hot from his look. I... Uh, she started to say, but failed to find the right words to continue. Many clauses were indeed in the contract, which she knew she should have read. However, back then, she was too eager to receive the money that would help tide her father over the financial crisis and did not foresee the subsequent event. So she did not pay close attention to that part in the contract about the breach of it. How much is the interest? Her voice started to shake again. In fact, she was rather reluctant to hear his answer, fearing that the sum would be astronomical. 
He looked slightly displeased now. Why are you so adamant to make things clear with me? I don't like to owe others. What I owe you, I'll return to you fully. Oh. His voice trailed off. Following a long silence, his lips curled into a faint smile. His eerie smile made her shudder and caused her breathing to turn ragged. This man can be so evil. Just like a king, his every look and smile demanded others' submission. She subconsciously straightened her spine so that she does not lose to his presence. He suddenly lifted his eyes, closed in on her face, and muttered in her ear, What if you get banned from showbiz? What will happen then? His voice was sexy and creamy, just like aged wine. Her facial expression changed. You... He slowly continued. Foxcom Entertainment is under Makewell Financial Group. If I am to ban someone, what do you think will happen? One word from him, and she would be thoroughly eradicated. Banning her was just a simple matter of opening his mouth. As Makewell's CEO, his words were law. No one would dare defy him. She muttered through clenched teeth, her eyes rimmed red. He casually held her cheek with his hand. His palm gently lifted her chin to his. She was forced to look into his playful eyes. You know what you must do now, right? Domineering and tyrannical, this man had always put himself above the rest. Every word was a command, and if he wanted her to do that, then she had to obey it. She was fuming inside. Logically speaking, this man was indeed beautiful, to the point of being faultless. He was good-looking, charismatic, and haughty like a god. No woman could possibly resist him. No other woman would want to refuse such a man. What was all this about, then? With her, of all women, did he really want her? Or was he just enjoying the thrill of her submitting to him? Although she had had intimate contact with him before, she still could not accept the idea of being his kept woman or serving someone without mutual love. He wanted her only because she was different from the rest of the women. What if she were like the others? Would he get tired of her, then? Silence. I see dead silence. Her eyes turned sunken like a puppet without a soul. She looked at him and asked, What do you want me to do? This was her way of telling him that she had finally succumbed to him. He nonchalantly replied, Pleasure me. Panic flashed across her face, but she regained her calmness in the next instant. She bit her lower lip and straddled him, slowly spreading herself out. Her small, pretty face slowly moved to his face without any emotion. She knew she could not run away this time. In this world, the weak were eaten by the strong. She did not have the right to refuse him and had to do whatever she wanted. He regarded her coldly as he lay on the couch motionlessly. What she did not know was that this was his first time being near a woman. In others' eyes, he was proud, noble, and untouchable. Many women wanted such a man. Many bachelors like him were known to be playboys. However, no one knew that, just like his detached persona, his emotional world was a blank. If he had to pinpoint a woman with whom he had an emotional attachment, he could only point at her. She was his one and only. He had serious issues with pretentious women, especially those like the flirtatious Christina with her heavy makeup. Monica was different from the rest, though. She even looked lovely today. Under the room's dim lights, her beautiful face was more mesmerizing than the moon to him. He took the liberty to enjoy the sight. Episode 83, I'll Teach You. Under the room's dim lights, her beautiful face was more mesmerizing than the moon to him. Monica was pretty. She had a porcelain melon face, almond-shaped eyes framed by long and curly eyelashes, thick and glossy hair, resembling a mixture of fine black feather and a fluttering butterfly wing, perfectly angled high nose bridge, and snowy white skin. All these made her look ravenous. She was already 24, yet still retained her youthful beauty. 
as she had given birth before, her body was well developed, causing her naivete to seem like a forbidden temptation. She was honestly a very beautiful girl, who seemed to have walked out of a painting. She had this serial aura that was untouched by this world. Just like six years ago, when he first met her, her innocently curled up form in bed immediately attracted him. She was the beautiful prey, and he was the eager hunter. Unfortunately, the little face currently inching toward him was frozen and stiff. That greatly displeased. Is that how you should look when pleasuring me? His sarcasm was like cold water splashing on her. His mocking tore her last strand of dignity, and she felt extremely embarrassed. He was out to make a fool of her, and she had no way to resist. She felt walled in, with no place to run or hide. Was she not walking into despondency? Her confusion and uneasiness aroused his interest. Don't tell me that you don't know how to. What? Don't know how to pleasure a man? I... Her face turned scalding red. He was evil, though. Yes or no? Answer me. He caught her face and refused to let her eyes look elsewhere. Am I your only man? He held her gaze. Her pleasant face glazed with a look of innocent embarrassment, which aroused his body even more. She was so blunt and explicit, her face burned even hotter this time. How to pleasure a man? Beside him, where else could she find another man? After giving birth to two sons for him, she kept Andres by her side. The news of her illegitimate child spread through the school like wildfire. She tried to justify it, but she didn't deny it. As a result, all of the males despised her and avoided her like a plague. She was the campus belle with good marks. Thus, she was popular with the boys and enraged many girls. Once the girls learned of Andre's existence, they made up malicious stories about her and humiliated their mother-son duo on campus. In the end, the principal recommended her to discontinue her studies. Andre's had to pull some threads in order to resolve the situation. It was only because of Andre's that she was able to graduate. Her youth was steeped with so much embarrassment, yet she regretted nothing about her decision. Andres was for spiritual sustenance. She rejected all suitors and stilled her heart for him. Right now, not only did this man recklessly offend her, but he also cruelly pointed out her inability to pleasure a man. She was extremely embarrassed. He felt relieved at her mortified look. This woman only had him? Stefan was quite surprised. He thought she had married or even had another man. Thus, the man pinched her face while harboring a bit of mischief. It was extraordinarily smooth and supple to the touch, as if it were free of petty cosmetics. Come, I'll teach you. He clutched her hand and moved it toward his collar. His long fingers held hers upright and hooked them on his bow tie. He carefully guided her. Untie it. Untie it? Monica's eyes went vacant, just like a soulless doll. As if she were possessed by a demon, she tugged at his exquisite bow tie. Untie. She inhaled a deep, chilling breath and gulped. She placed her hands on his chest, and taking her sweet time, she clumsily unbuttoned his shirt. Dissatisfied with her slow movement, he bit her lower lip in punishment. She only lowered her flushed face. Her fingers, as fair as jade, unbuttoned his shirt one by one. Everything he wore was commissioned and was made to the finest detail. Every button was securely fastened, so it was hard to take off. She pursed her lips, her cheeks gradually becoming scalding hot. When she looked up, she only saw a of desire in his eyes. You... Before she could finish her words... He grabbed her wrist and pulled her into his embrace. He lifted her chin with his long fingers, and with eyes slanted, he kissed her exploringly. He pushed into her slightly parted lips and entwined her sweetness with his. The taste of red wine lingered on their lips. Her heartbeat suddenly accelerated, and a scarlet flush crept into her cheeks. He supported his half-seated body with one hand, 
and circled her waist domineeringly with the other. He adjusted his body and leaned on the sofa more, proceeding to pull her into a sitting position on his lap. With one hand on her waist, he held her nape with another hand and mashed their lips together more deeply. He traced her lips lightly, smoothly and softly. Tiny jolt of electricity seemed to have flown through with his touch. A heart quivering sensation then spread to her limbs and bones, and her body unknowingly heated up in response. She seemed to be at somewhat of a loss, but she did not know how to react to the kiss. Slowly, even her breathing became erratic and labored. The creator was simply magical. The masculinity of men and the femininity of women came together in perfect harmony. His kiss had a frightening charm. It could remind her of the memories she had buried deep inside her. The man gave an evil smirk. His long, icy fingers removed her shoulder straps and differently took off her clothes and barely ghosted up her nape. Her heart slightly clenched as she reached out to grab his hand. A faint smile crept across his mouth. He flipped his hand around to grab her fingertips and led them to the front of his body. As her fingertips met his buttons, her face instantly turned red. With the tip of their noses touching, he licked and kissed the side of her lips, and said in a gentle voice, Help me. His kisses traveled downward to her eyes, the tip of her nose, the side of her lips, and her chin. Thereafter, he gently opened the button of her blouse, and with his teeth gnawing at her sash, he loosened it slowly. He then raised his face, his smoldering eyes gazing penetratingly, and his lips grinning sinisterly. He unbuttoned her blouse indifferently. She tried to regain her sanity as she pushed his shoulders away with whatever strength she had, but her mind became increasingly hazier as it fled elsewhere. Episode 84 She is Worth It in the event hall, Martin mingled in the crowd with his mind elsewhere. He turned a deaf ear to the people that were trying to exchange pleasantries with him. More than 15 minutes had passed since Monica went upstairs, and he was starting to worry. Gala had yet to officially start, but everyone was already socializing with one another. It could also be considered as part of the event's schedule. Unfortunately, he had lost the desire to participate in this, as the gala's attendees entertained one another, he expressionlessly remained seated on one of the VIP seats by himself. Looking from the side, his handsome eyes seemed to be sealed in ice. With knitted brows, he lowered his eyes and narrowed them. He held a glass of red wine, which had not been drunk on for a while, and sat still for a long time. Clara saw him sitting alone, and immediately left the starlights engaging her in a pleasant talk. She tidied herself up and saw shade toward him. Halfway there, someone bumped into her shoulder and her body tipped over. She staggered and almost lost her footing. The glass in her hand nearly smashed onto the ground. Her face was clouded with anger. With furrowed brows, she looked to see who had crashed into her and realized that it was Christina. The animosity she felt was somewhat reduced at the sight of her, and a polite smile blossomed on her lips instead. Christina! She pursed her lips in disdain. She was feeling indignant, but had no way of venting it on the other. Present, Christina had booming popularity, and with the Woods group as her bunker, her career was currently on an upward path. Claire did not dare offend her because of these. Christina regarded her coldly and poked fun at her. Claire, you look so wonderful and dazzling tonight. Claire forced out a smile to conceal the awkwardness on her face and complimented her. How can I compare to you, Christina? With your soaring popularity and thriving career, I'm really happy for you. She raised her glass and toasted to her after saying this. Christina merely rolled her eyes and ignored her toast. Thus, Claire's hand, which was holding the glass of wine, awkwardly hung in midair. Don't think I don't know what you're scheming. How can you even match up with Martin? Claire innocently widened her eyes and said with a smile, oh, What are you talking about? 
I don't understand. Martin is someone I aspire to be like. Don't you dare resort to any underhanded means. Disgusting. What? She cried out in discontent. Feigning innocence, she continued. I really don't know what you're talking about. Christina mocked. Huh. You think I don't know that there's something wrong with the wine you're holding? A trace of bluster crept across her face, but she quickly schooled her features in fake composure. Acting confused, she asked, What can be wrong with it? Whether there's something wrong with it or there's none, you'll know when you take a gulp, right? Christina sarcastically countered. Claire's face instantly flushed, and she was at a loss for words. Surveying her with ridicule, Christina sneered. Poor schemer. You think Martin won't be able to see through you? Claire nonchalantly placed the glass aside and replied coolly, I'm just copying you. What did you say? Christina flared up. Everyone in this industry knows how you got to your current position. By using the same trick. You think we're all fools? She asked with contempt. Back then, Claire was originally the female lead for a drama. Her role was forcibly taken away by Christina. The latter had also relied on a glass of wine to settle everything with the investors. In the end, with the drama becoming that year's blockbuster, she blazed her way through the movie festival and successfully clinched the title of Best Actress. She even bagged an offer to act for a few more movies. Crowned with the title of Global Female Star, Christina's popularity went through the roof. All those things should have been hers. As such, Claire bore a grudge against Christina. The two had been secretly competing with each other ever since. Christina threatened, Claire, you'd better be more respectful toward me. If you try to be funny again, I'll expose your affair with Edward to the paparazzi. You! She broke into a smile. All right, then. I'll expose all your past affairs to the media. I doubt you have more to expose than me. What do you think? Do you think you can win against me? Christina was unfazed by her threat and provoked further. If you insist on fighting with me, let's just wait and see. Claire gritted her teeth in anger. As much as she hated to admit it, she knew that that she could not win a fight against Christina. Christina sneered as she stormed off. Going back to her, Christina quickly approached Martin in her high heels after smoothing her hair. With a gentle pout, she asked, Martin, where are you all alone? Where's your partner? She looked around. He furrowed his brows, but did not comment or even look at her. She seemed to be holding a hunch and whispered while concealing a grin with her hand, did you ditch you to drink with the big boss? His expression shifted a little, but he still maintained a silence. I don't want to be nosy here, but you'd be better off keeping your distance from her. The entertainment industry is filled with dirty women like her that will do anything to get ahead of the competition. Drinking and sleeping around is nothing new. You'd better be careful. Hal bent on destroying Monica's image in his mind, Christina did not restrain her words. She could not stomach him being exceptionally kind to an undistinguished newbie. He was aloof and haughty to everyone, including her. What she could not have, she would not let Monica have either. She continued her slandering. You can see that this Monica is very ambitious. She plans to use you as a stepping stone by partnering with you tonight. Every person here is someone distinguished and important. 
what does that make you when you bring a nobody like her? Besides, I heard that she's suddenly turned to regard her with displeased eyes. That's enough, I say. But, Martin? She looked at him wistfully. Why are you looking so mad now? Big mouth. Big mouth? Her face turned red with anger and embarrassment. Why are you criticizing me? I'm saying this for your good, you know? She's only using you. Don't you understand? He could not be bothered with her. I'm willing to be used by her. Don't tell me you like that kind of woman. What kind? Your kind? He did not hide his revulsion to her as he sarcastically spat. Like what you did before when you slept with an investor in exchange for a role in Black Beauty? She gasped when she heard that. Not everyone is as shameless as you. He added coldly before skimming past her. She chased after him and bitterly asked, Martin, how do you know that she's not like that? How much do you know about her? Seeing him ignore her, she took a few steps forward and unrelentingly asked, She could get such a big role even before entering the show business? Do you really think she's that innocent? Why are you defending her all the time? Is she worth it? He stood still, pondered for a while, and then recalled Monica's beautiful and innocent face. The corner of his lips curved into a smile as he replied, She is worth it. Episode 85, No One Is To Touch Her. She is worth it. Christina was stunned. His answer was a big blow to her. Justin Woods had been searching for Christina and was displeased to see her with Martin. Martin saw him as well and jeeringly asked, Mr. Woods, can't you even keep an eye on your woman? Justin's face sank upon hearing his words. What do you mean? He snorted. She's been flirting around. You'd better watch over her, or you may be made a cuckold. He strode off with that. She was absolutely infuriated. Justin was even more so. Audibly sneering at her, he stormed off. Justin, listen to me! She rushed to explain. Behind, Sarah was laughing derisively. Go for wool and come home short. Really shameless. It was eerily quiet along the corridor. Martin was getting worried. The entertainment industry was materialistic and chaotic. A woman like Monica would be akin to a sheep in a wolf's den in this industry. She would be devoured if left unprotected. He should have stayed by her side. He had been careless. He thought of that attendant who had taken her away to change clothes and realized how fishy it was now. While there were restrooms and first aid rooms at a place like this, dressing rooms were unheard of. What would also be here were VIP suites for the important guests that needed to quench the fire. When an investor set his eyes on an actress, he would present her with a glass of wine laced with drugs. Once the drug began to take effect, an attendant would be instructed to bring the actress to a VIP suite. He was not thinking straight earlier, but once he had the chance to ponder about it, he became worried. There was once a sweet young lady who had attended a grand occasion like this for the first time. Her naivete quickly appealed to a few investors who had drugged her and brought to a room. It was said that the starlet was pillaged by seven or eight men that day and almost went mad. She was later rushed to the hospital, barely breathing. Those men were big shots and managed to keep this matter private. This industry was that cruel. The more he thought of it, the more alarmed he became. He did not see the end of this long corridor. His footsteps were hasty. As he passed by one of the rooms, he indistinctly caught a few intermittent moans and groans. The sounds were real, despite them being indistinct. He stopped abruptly. Old beads of sweat appeared on his forehead. Alert by nature, he was able to catch the muffled sounds coming from inside the room, despite its good soundproofing. He walked with fear toward the door. From within the room, a woman moaned in agony amid a few men's unbridled gasps and wild laughter. The noise seemed to pierce his eardrums as he listened. Damn! He gritted his teeth and wasted no time, wrapped his knuckles on the door. No one seemed to hear that. Monica? Monica! He grabbed the door handle and screwed it hard. 
The door remained shut, as it was locked from the inside. He had no more patience. He took a few steps backward, leaped into the air, and did a perfect flying kick to break down the door. The room was filled with decadent musk as he walked in. The man's evil laughter and the unpleasant sound coming from the bedroom warned him of what was going on inside. Frowned, with his nerves down, taut in agitation, he took large strides toward the bedroom. The immediate scene that greeted him when he reached it made his face sink. Emma was all tied up in the middle of a large bed. Her forelimbs were bound to each corner of the bedpost. She was no longer pretty. Her exquisite makeup was ruined with her messy hair spread about the pillow. Her cheeks were flesh red, and her eyes looked lax and disoriented. Few old men were sitting on the bed, looking listless and exhausted. Only Charlie was still riding her hard. Hearing the foreign sound, he turned to look angrily and was surprised to found Martin standing there. Martin, how did you get in? The door is not locked, Martin answered calmly. Seeing that it was not Monica on the bed, his heart eased. In any case, this Emma was not a decent woman. Her ambitious nature and despicable ways had led her to these bigwigs. He was no stranger to such debauchery and knew very well that it took two hands to clap for this to happen. Those men got high and aroused before the official kickoff, so they were looking for some entertainment. Emma came at the right time. She attended this gala with the intention of entering the show business through any means. She instead ended up being booted out by Martin before the event even started. She did not want to leave without achieving her goal, so in desperation, she agreed to Charlie's request. She did not expect to meet a pack of hungry wolves, though. She had drunk that spiked drink by mistake, and it took its effect on her. She was no match for the drug's potency. The men proceeded to plunder her through and through. Do you want to do it too? Charlie asked as he heaved a huge sigh. He patted Emma's face with much satisfaction. This woman isn't that bad. Not interested. Martin coldly rejected and turned to leave. Charlie called out to him from behind. Where's your lady partner? That stopped him in his tracks as his back turned stiff. Charlie did not care to read his expression or notice his menacing aura, and nearly continued with enthusiasm. If the sister is this good, Monica should be good too. Charlie, didn't you mention earlier that there will be a good show coming up? The man beside him asked with interest. Which show is that? Martin, your lady partner is Monica, right? She's a rarity. I like her type. Why don't you bring her over now before the gala starts? You can do some entertainment here. Martin turned around, with his eyes flashing a dangerous look. He warned, No one is to touch you. Why should we listen to you? I like that woman. Charlie's face turned sullen. He threw Emma aside and got up off the bed as he viciously said, Who are you to stop me from wanting that woman? The powerful get what they want here. I, Charlie, get whichever woman I want. Before he could finish his words, Martin, with an icy look, shot to him like an arrow, and grabbed him by the crown of his hair. He yelped in pain. What are you doing? Are you mad? Ah! Oh! Martin's lips curled into a bloody smile. Fletching his hair, he dragged him for a few meters before he yanked him up.
devoid of fear. Bang! A loud gunshot echoed in the room. Episode 87 Terrified Bang! Sound of a gunshot resonated across the room. Monica was jolted out of her dazed state and returned to her senses. Recovering, she managed to pull back some of her wandering thoughts. She looked at the man already embracing her for who knew when. Her hands were holding on to his shoulders. They looked quite intimate. She exclaimed, somewhat shocked by what was happening. Why? She gritted her teeth in embarrassment. She was clearly disgusted at her discomposure a while ago. So why had her body unknowingly gone out of her control? Was this man knowledgeable in enchantment? Why didn't you continue? Stefan looked at her mischievously and provocatively. I... Getting shy, huh? He lifted her chin and pinched it. His fingertips gently stroked the outline of her lips. Certainly took the initiative just now. No, you didn't. Lies. He hugged her. Continue. She was shocked. She carefully pushed his shoulders away with her hands and tried to escape from his confinement by turning to the side. Just now, there was a gunshot. You don't have to care about other people's things. Look at me. He pulled her face upright. With his thin lips, he spoke in an unruly but charming fashion. Kiss me. The sensation he felt from kissing her just then nearly made him lose his soul. Kissing her was enough to make him lose his control and even lose himself. He could not wait to snuggle her into his embrace, into his blood and bones, and they became one. This woman had the resources to bewitch any man. How could he let go of her? I don't... don't want... We were already halfway through. Why not continue? He leaned closer to her. Her whole face, including her earlobes, was blushing now. He was delighted at her response. In a charmingly soft voice, he said, You were also enjoying it. Hmm? Her face turned even rosier. It was now beet red. This man exuded hormones from head to toe. He was simply irresistible. He was different from Martin. The latter was a very gentlemanly man. His every movement gave off the elegance of a person from high society. The former, meanwhile, was the embodiment of nobility. He was domineering, alluring, and akin to an absolute ruler. If he were born in ancient times, he would undoubtedly be an emperor. Martin was still waiting for her. A tinge of uneasiness surfaced in her eyes as she felt slightly worried. At this very moment, Martin's voice was heard from the corridor outside. Monica? Monica? His voice sounded so close to her, as if they were only separated by a door. His voice came across early. Monica bulged her eyes in astonishment. Following his voice, she shifted her sight in the direction of the door, only to hear a gentle voice from outside. Monica, are you here? Don't be afraid. In the future, no matter what happens, I'll protect you. She was totally paralyzed. Stefan's expression changed. As if covered by a thousand-year layer of snow, he was suddenly full of hostility. Martin. She suddenly felt embarrassed. What was she actually doing? Was she selling her body? Was there a difference between her and those women? If Martin were to witness the scene, what would he think? Monica, I can't believe that you are the same as those women. He would definitely regard her coldly, mock her, and degrade her. No, I'm not. She abruptly turned away from Stefan's body and slightly staggered toward the door. Stop right there. Stefan gazed at Monica with a gloomy face. The entire room was just like an ice cellar. She was fixated on walking toward the door, as if she hadn't heard anything. She didn't want to be regarded as a second-class citizen. She wasn't that kind of woman. She bit down hard on her lower lip. Her hand had just touched the doorknob when he appeared from behind her, striding up to her, grabbing her by the waist, and carrying her up. She cried out and struggled. Stefan, let me go! You want him to see you now? He held her cheek firmly and maintained eye contact with her fear-filled eyes. He asked emotionlessly, 
I'll let him in to look at you now. Huh? No. She was so flustered that she was at a loss. She shuddered at his threat. She did not wish for Martin to enter the room and was even more unwilling to face him in this manner. This was her last straw of pride. Stefan, you can't do that. I hope you understand now, he announced. I never take no for an answer. If I want something, one has to give it. After he said this, he forcefully threw her onto the large and soft bed. Her body lightly bounced on the bed. The man's towering body then inclined and pressed down on her as it blocked the luminous moonlight. She was shocked and felt suffocated. She started to struggle with anxiety. Her hands furiously hit his chest. The man did not budge for even an inch. No matter how hard she pushed and shoved, it was futile. Why was this man so domineering? And this forceful? He kept her under his control and planted a kiss on her with his chilly lips. It was a nearly aggressive kiss. A kiss that did not seem to contain any affection. Her face instantly paled in color. Afraid, she clenched her teeth and her shoulders slightly trembled. He was sometimes gentle, sometimes careful, and sometimes crazed, just like a tempest sweeping across. He kissed her softly. She was clenching her teeth. He looked at her with dissatisfaction. His long fingertips pinched her cheek, and he said in an attractive, hoarse voice, open wide. She panted nervously, but her jaws remained tightly shut. The man was disappointed. Slightly narrowing his eyes, he held her cheeks with his large hands and pinched them hard. The pinch hurt her, and she sucked in a breath of chilling air. Taking this opportunity, he swept her away gently. She was somewhat taken aback by his fixed passion. He was domineering, overwhelming, and a sting of defiance. She could not help but retreat with a flushed face. Her body was stiff, as if it had been jolted by electricity. She raised her eyes to meet his deep ones. She involuntarily let out a small, furtive yelp. The man was examining her. Places he laid his handsome eyes on made her tremble uncontrollably. He did not know how the small person below him could spark some excitement in him. He especially liked to see her flustered look. It was truly and extremely entertaining. It was just like spotting a cute prey. He had the interest to play with her. He surveyed her face once more. Half of it seemed to be dyed in the color of peach blossoms. This girl clearly had a pretty and flirtatious appearance. A living fairy whom people would be head over heels for. But her aura was just too pure and clean. There was no conflict when these two traits merged. On the contrary... There was more of a forbidden allure to it. This was just like a spell, and no meditation could undo it. This girl, as charming as she was, was overly youthful. Episode 88 Was This Considered as Love? This girl, as charming as she was, was overly youthful. She probably did not know of this. Sometimes the harder a woman struggled the stronger desire a man would have to dominate her. Stefan willfully pressed down on her and quickly covered her supple lips. He held her nape with one hand and gently caressed her back with the other. As if electricity were flowing through them, his long fingers went along her shoulders and traveled downward as they slowly moved to other parts of her body. Monica felt slightly awful at being suppressed. To be precise, she was feeling uneasy. However, sensing the cold and strange touches sweeping across her stomach, she suddenly forgot the struggle. A strange sensation made her entire body freeze and shiver. Don't! She knitted her brows in discomfort. She had just spouted a word when a distinct and strange sensation, those traces of pain, made her scalp tingle instantly. Fragmented memories from that night suddenly flashed before her eyes and her shoulders uncontrollably shuddered. Firmly pressing on her mouth, he let out an evil laugh. He grasped her cheeks with force and furiously bit her lower lip. She was too thin, her waist seemingly able to fit his one hand. She wanted to reject his advances time and again, but that strange instinctive feeling inside her stopped her each time. 
Similarly, he was an irresistible man. He had a handsome face and a body one was unable to nitpick at. Amidst her futile resistance, her body intuitively yearned for affection. Her desires and rationality were in constant conflict, and she nearly wanted to break down. Look, you want it as well, hmm? The man smirked and took his time unbuttoning her clothes. However, as he looked up, his eyes met with her half-closed yet flustered pair. Monica shut her eyes in despair as he lightly peeked her cheeks. Good. I won't hurt you. He usually carried himself well in bed. He was never impatient with his prey. A gentility that he seemed to naturally possess. Right now, his body was extremely taut. His large hands supported her waist, and he drowned her in the endless night. Outside the corridor, Martin heard her indistinct voice from a room with his keen hearing. Monica? He turned to glance at a magnificent door. It was the only presidential suite, the most glamorous room in the hotel. Rumors had it that this suite was never open to the public. He suddenly seemed to have figured it out. Charlie's words rang in his ears. That Monica is the woman whom Mr. Lewis has his eyes on. Give up. You can't win against him. Martin pursed his lips. He was not a man that had seen only little of the world. He naturally understood what was happening inside the room. His eyes darkened, and he clenched his fists. His legs could barely move for the longest time. He actually lost the courage to break open the door. Charlie's questioning earlier still echoed in his ears. Why are you so concerned with Monica? Could it be that you're in love with her? She's not even yours. So on what grounds are you making indiscreet remarks? Love? Did he love her? Martin was suddenly a little confused. He had never loved a woman before, so he did not know what it was like to be in love. Being nervous, worried, and protective, were these considered as being in love? He had an indecipherable feeling toward her the first time he saw her. The girl was so elegant and ethereal that she appeared to be out of this world. He wanted to properly keep her away from the influences of this world. During the audition for the role of Diana Stark, Monica had made an impact on everyone present with her very realistic portrayal. Even he was naturally brought into Nathan Stark's character by her performance, to the point of him wanting to protect her from any harm in his embrace. Her every expression was deeply imprinted in his mind, and they could not be removed. Was this love? If it were not, then why did he care for her? Was it simply because she had the talent and potential to be a future star? He suddenly had a splitting headache. He leaned his back against the wall and buried his face in his hands. His heart was plunged into chaotic misery. He did not know how long he had waited. It just felt so long, it almost seemed as if time had stopped. He wanted to break into the room time and time again, but whenever he reached the door, something would make him retreat. He was thus in for a long, torturous wait. This was when he heard people approaching from one end of the corridor. He looked toward the source of the footsteps and saw a group of waiters holding up trays, making their way over to the presidential suite slowly and respectfully. A few pieces of new and gorgeous gowns, along with exquisite accessories, were laid on the trays. Walking in line with this group was Zoe. He was shocked to see him. With his eyes slightly shifting, he asked, Martin, why are you here? What are you here for? Martin glanced sharply at him and knitted his brows. The CEO summoned me here to prepare a lady for the gala. Zoe was a smart man. Noticing Martin's heartbroken expression, he suddenly had a foreboding feeling. That lady inside, could it be Miss Monica? Shut up! Martin snapped as he suddenly flew into a rage. Zoe quickly shut his mouth and dared not ask further. Women were indeed poison. An example was this. Monica was able to make Martin, an elegant and approachable man, react irrationally. Who was she, exactly? Sounds suddenly came from inside the room. Martin returned to his senses in that instant, and his face was colored with shock. He looked over just in time to see Stefan come out of the room. The man was already clad in an exquisite suit. No traces of intimate activities could be observed on his person. It was still that imperial elite in everyone's eyes. He shot Martin a cold look. 
He did not seem to be surprised by his presence there. He emotionlessly cast his eyes over to Zoe and ordered in a low voice, Get in. Yes, sir. Zoe, who had stood there quietly without looking sideways, led the waiters into the room. The door was then shut. Martin proceeded to march towards Stefan and grabbed his neatly ironed pie. He questioned him bitterly. What did you do to her? Both men's presence was equally domineering, and they continually gave off a dangerous vibe. Stefan's height towered over Martin's, though. Thus, he was looking down at him when he gave a vague answer. What do you think? Fools. Martin paled in anger. Without warning, he threw a straight punch at him. Stefan slightly turned to the side with a calm expression and caught his swift fist firmly. He did not seem to have moved an inch. The shock was observed in Martin's eyes. You're quite skilled. Looks like Serena Lee has taught you well. Stefan forcibly shook his hand off, and Martin involuntarily took a few steps backward. The man took large, graceful strides toward him, lowered his eyes, and emotionally squinted at him. I didn't expect that Martin would also lose his composure over a woman. Episode 89, Truth is Out I didn't expect that Martin would lose his composure over a woman. Martin countered with a solemn look. Composure? This goes for you too, CEO Lewis. Aren't you ashamed of using such methods just to get a woman? Stefan's eyes dimmed, and he coldly replied, I'm a businessman. I get what I want. And this includes her. She's my woman. I won't allow anyone to covet her. His tyrannical warning stunned Martin. Martin suddenly realized that Stefan was possessive of Monica, to the point of being cruel to her. Stefan had always been ambitious, and he would use whatever means necessary to get what he wanted. Stefan saw the danger of losing Monica. He had even forced her to take off that evening gown at the boutique store earlier, because he disliked seeing her being glamorous for another man. In this gala, she was outstanding and radiant. Every man present was besotted with her. He also saw her reliance and trust in Martin. As a man with keen business acumen, he easily understood that he would lose his chance with her if he did not do something about it. He wanted her so badly that he would even clip off her wings to prevent her from flying away. He would cage her to his side so that others would not have a chance with her. He would give her an unlimited amount of love and pampering, but she could only have this in his embrace and no one else. He was such a person. Your woman? Martin had a disdainful look. What about Gracia, then? Oh, don't you know? He sneered. Presence is inconsequential. Inconsequential? Martin was unable to mask his surprise. Stefan was hardly known except for the fact that he was engaged to his childhood sweetheart. They have a child, which is believed to be by surrogacy, because there were speculations that Gracia was infertile. Even world-renowned physicians couldn't cure Gracia's congenital problem. Martin inhaled sharply at this thought. Surrogacy? Stefan looked penetratingly at the other man and smiled slightly upon sensing his suspicion. He then coldly confirmed, Sam's biological mother is Monica Thames. Martin was badly shaken by this news and stared disbelievingly at the man. Stefan casually asked, Is it wrong to go after my child's mother? Martin recalled those shocking details. That boy he had seen beside her indeed possessed the same features as Sam. If this was the case, everything could be explained. She was the surrogate mother chosen by the Lewis family back then? Why? What did that mean to him now? He did not mind her past. Martin gazed up at him and determinedly said, Love goes both ways, right? She will not fall in love with you. She will. The man lifted his head. With his proud chin held high, he resolutely declared, She will fall in love with me. His words were spoken aloofly and tyrannically. This was a confidence which only a business tycoon could have. No one could fight with such charisma. He strode off after saying this. Martin stood rooted to the spot. In a dimly lit hotel room, 
Emma opened her sleepy eyes. The aching pain that shot through her body reminded her of what had just happened. She drank the wine given by Charlie, despite knowing where it would lead. The men were looking for some fun to pass the time before the show's start. She had nowhere to go and was desperate to find any means to stay put. She did not want to leave the gala without achieving her goal. If there was a chance, regardless of its form, she would grasp it. It was her ultimate dream to become a star. Consumed by her desire, she would do anything for a chance. She opened her eyes and sat up on the bed. This was when she saw the mess on the floor. She hurriedly switched on the lights and was shocked at the sight before her. Shirts were strewn all over the bed, and beside it, Charlie was lying unconscious on the floor with a few men. Meanwhile, Sylvester was lying lamely on the couch and was moaning in pain. Blood oozed from a gaping wound in his arm, which heavily stained his shirt. She was thoroughly shaken. She was clueless as to what had caused this gruesome sight, for she had lost consciousness earlier. She only woke up to it. She grabbed her clothes and crept toward the door barefoot. In her hurry, she stepped on something hard, which caused her soul to curl in pain. She looked down and saw a bloody pistol. She inwardly screamed in fear. Her brain seemed to have exploded with a bang. Why is there a gun here? What happened in this room earlier? Sylvester's painful whispers could be heard from behind her. Damn you, Martin. I'm going to kill you. Martin? She hid herself in one corner, her face paling with fear. She could see the man painfully struggling to get up off the couch from where she was. Mustering his remaining strength, he kicked Charlie. Wake up! Uh, jolted out of his unconsciousness, he was shocked to see him in an awkward state. Sylvester, what happened to you? Quickly, give me help. I'm shot and losing a lot of blood. Who is that Martin exactly? We previously thought that she is just a gigolo, but he turned out to be a martial arts expert. He sounded incredulous as he supported Sylvester. Earlier, Sylvester had removed his pistol's safety catch and threateningly pointed it to Martin. He was just trying to instill fear in the young chap. In a split second, Martin unexpectedly leaped at him, wrestled the gun from his hand, and fired a bullet at his arm. A series of actions was smoothly executed. Not happen without professional training. Sylvester, how do you plan to deal with this? What's my plan? He laughed chillingly. I'll teach that chap a lesson, of course. Charlie nodded in full agreement. Emma drew a sharp intake of breath when she heard this. It was so scary. Sylvester caught the faint sound and cried out, Who is that? That got her scrambling out of the room as she hid her appearance in the shadows. Frightening. Sylvester indeed had powerful connections among the Mafia. The rumors circulating on the internet were true after all. The more his words echoed, the more fearful she became. Before she could tidy herself up after her flight from the room, she met Claire, Christina, the two's entourage, and even Samatha, who had arrived late. Episode 90, Defamation Sylvester had powerful connections in the Mafia indeed. The rumors circulating on the internet were true after all. The more his words echoed, the more fearful she became. Before she could tidy herself up after her flight from the room, she met Claire, Christina, the two's entourage, and even Semica, who had arrived late. Tonight was Fox Com Entertainment's annual gala. Samatha's father was one of the company's largest shareholders, so naturally, she had to be present. However, when she reached the venue, she did not see the person that was on her mind. It was only expected that she would feel disappointed. She thus ended up following Claire and the others to the lounge for a respite. At the entrance to the elevator, however, their group bumped into Emma. Caught off guard, Emma froze to the spot. She was intending to leave without being seen by anyone, but she unexpectedly bumped into them. Claire disdainfully inspected her, before snorting scornfully. Edward, who was standing by her side, could not help but furrow his brows. Stella spat. Pitch! What a disgrace! 
Even Samatha had dust written all over her face when she looked at her. She scoffed. <laughs> Where did this crazy bitch come from? Samatha, this is something you don't know. This woman is a thief. She passed off somebody else's gown as hers and attempted to sneak into the venue to curry favor with those in power. She was just exposed by Martin. She probably used some underhanded means and climbed up a certain big shot's bed to gain status. Emma pursed her lips in embarrassment and rage when she heard this. She put on a pitiful image. If those who were in the dark saw this, they would go soft-hearted for her. However, everyone here knew of her true colors, so naturally, they did not fall for her act. Even Edward, who had taken care of her before, showed a disgusted expression, as if he had swallowed a fly. Emma felt even more indignant when she observed this scene. She thoroughly hated that mouth of Claire's. If she could, she would tear down that mouthful of gossips. It isn't what you think it is. All of you are being deceived by Monica. She isn't how she projects herself to be. She buried her face in her hands and cried miserably. She looked so pitiful, and nobody could say that she was acting. Claire sneered. Huh. If she isn't what we think she is, then what is she truly like? She wept. This is all Monica's I didn't steal her gown. She gave it to me. She said that she disliked it. I didn't expect her to lie and say that I stole it. There's truly really nothing I can do to clear my name. Claire creased her brows at her words, and she went silent for a moment, seemingly thinking of something. Christina suddenly asked, What you said... Is it the truth? Yes. I was originally coming to the gala with Charlie Sanchez. Jeers traveled through the group at the mention of Charlie Sanchez. Those in the entertainment industry were very aware of how the man was as a person. Anyone linked with him would have a big discount on their image. She felt even more wrong at this. Tears flowed out from her eyes like a broken string of pearls. She sobbed pitifully. <laughs> really, everyone... Please, don't just believe Monica's one-sided statement. I'm really not a thief, as I've never stolen anything from her. Christina raised an eyebrow in disbelief and questioned, Why should we believe your one-sided statement? Emma trembled all over as she answered, Do you all believe her one-sided statement? She's always acting innocent, when in fact, she's the most cunning. She paused for a while before continuing, you all saw what had happened earlier. She's obviously a rookie, but she dressed up in the glamour and sought the limelight. She's clearly here to push herself forward and create hype. I'm sure everyone doesn't know of this. She grew up in a welfare center. Welfare center? Claire suddenly spoke with an underlying intention. I heard that those children who grow up in a welfare center are very mature. They already know how to strive for a favor. Yes. My dad adopted her at a very young age, but as you can see, whether it be food and clothes, she's treated better than me. At home, she knows how to curry favor through trickery. My dad treasures her, yet she still did this to me. Once again, she paused, and then she started crying piteously. She's just an unwanted child. If it weren't for my dad adopting her, she'd surely have a hard time. But she doesn't even know how to repay gratitude with kindness, and instead requited us with ingratitude. Everyone started gossiping about this. Is this true? I couldn't tell at all that Monica is that kind of woman. I think what she said is the truth. Some women look very innocent on the outside, but are actually really shrewd on the inside. A streak of success secretly flashed across her eyes at the reaction. Soon after, she showed yet another pitiful expression. I was leaving the venue after changing my clothes when she came over to pass me a cup of tea. I didn't suspect a thing, and when I woke up, I'm already in this state. Edward felt upset for her. As an androcentric man, a weak and neat girl like her easily ignited his desire to protect. Men were different from women in that they did not usually bother to think too deeply about things. Frankly speaking, after being in this line of work for years, he still did not understand rivalries in the entertainment industry. Claire and Christina were different, though. They were considered as veterans in the industry, 
and have seen the execution of many types of tribes. Christina just needed to look at Emma once, and she could tell what she was plotting. She did not expose her simply, because the latter was not in a conflict of interest with her. Her defamation of Monica was exactly what Claire and the others wanted. She wanted to see what would happen if the sisters fought. Edward heard her advice, and from his expression, he had a forethought. He cast his eyes down at Emma and asked her skeptically, Emma, is what you said all true? Yes, what I said is the truth. I swear to God. Giving her reply, she even held her palm up to take a solemn vow. Episode 91, Target Yes, what I said is the truth, I swear to God! Giving this reply, Emma even held her palms up to take a solemn vow. All right, I believe you, Edward smilingly said. She broke into grateful tears. Edward continued angrily, Monica's too much. You're her younger sister, and your father raised her, so how could she do this to you? <laughs> Emma pretended to cry and grieve, though she was feeling smug inside. She did not reckon for him to believe her story until now. He was just too naive and simple-minded. As long as Emma had Edward's backing, she could get out of this bad situation. She may look innocent, but she's actually very calculative. She must have used tricks to bewitch men. Her words only made others angrier. Everyone saw how Martin had shielded her earlier. That woman must be a vixen reincarnate. Or why would the men be so eager to protect and please her? Stop crying. Your eyes are already swollen. It's all in the past. She'll get her retribution one day. Edward patted her shoulder consolingly. Thank you, Edward. She thanked him amid her thoughts. She looked at him with such pity-inducing sorrow, her cheeks flushed as tears glimmered in her eyes. She knew this would hit his weak spot. Sarah did not expect him to go to such lengths to protect a newcomer. Does that mean he likes this kind of woman? You're good with your acting. How do we know if you are truly an unwilling party in this affair? Semika did not mince her words. You can find all kinds of women in this industry. They'll stop at nothing to get ahead of the competition. You'd better get lost quickly. It's revolting to see you like this. Edward frowned in annoyance and wanted to rebuke but he kept quiet when he saw Clara glaring at him. Stupid man going to throw away his rice bowl for a woman? Semika was the daughter of the biggest shareholder in Foxcom Entertainment, and it was his agency as well as his source of income. If this woman was antagonized by him, he might be unreservedly banned. Edward was a top idol, and gossips regarding them made for a hot topic now. She needed to protect her soaring popularity. How did you fool? Claire blurted out, but quickly caught herself and corrected. Who did this to you? Emma's face was fearful and embarrassed when she heard that. Was Claire trying to embarrass her? Everyone was suddenly interested to hear her answer. Everyone wanted to know who could be so sadistic to leave so many bruises and bite marks on her. That's right. Who did this to you? No, I can't say that. I don't dare to tell. She trembled when she recalled Sylvester's sadistic ways and threats. It was truly terrifying. Sylvester and Charlie were of the same kind. They were ferocious in bed and could do anything for fun. They almost broke her bones when they were at it. It was terrifying. When she displayed that terrified expression, Edward naturally took pity on her again. Why are you afraid? You can be truthful here. We'll back you up. Christina was also keen to find out who had tortured Emma to such an extent. No, that person told me not to breathe a word, so I don't dare to tell. She did not stop shaking. The rest imagined differently based on her words, however. The person must be someone powerful to make her quake in fear. However, if one was to think of a man in this gala who would fit this bill with his elite background, then it could only be... Oh! Where's Mr. Lewis? He was here a while ago. Someone voiced out that little suspicion. Before the words were completed, Gracia appeared on the scene with Sam at her heels. They took steps toward the elevator and were startled to see the crowd before them. Sam, who was disinterestedly holding and sucking on a lollipop, 
quickly hid behind his mother in fear when he saw them. He had been hidden from the public's eyes by Stefan since his infancy. He was not afraid of strangers, but he disliked being gawked at by a crowd. This was the rest's first time to see him in the flesh, so everyone was curious to check out this little lad who would inherit the Lewis group in the future. Their spirits, which held curious and surprised, made him uncomfortable. This was especially true for Samika, who was looking at him with mixed emotions that included jealousy, hysteric friendship. Isn't this the son whom Gracia bore from my dear brother Stefan? I'll marry into the Lewis family one day, and my child with brother Lewis will be the rightful heir instead. The little lad was getting displeased with the attention. He coldly glanced over at the group and hid himself further behind Gracia. Gracia was getting unhappy with the commotion and asked with a warning look, Why is everyone crowding here? She saw them glancing at Emma, whom she immediately showed her revulsion for. Why are you still here? You've been kicked out. Emma's eyes displayed even greater horror when she saw the woman speaking to her. This only made the rest speculate further. Someone made a daring assumption. Could it be that she had an illicit affair with the president of Make Wealth, Stefan? There were no unruly gossips associated with the man before, and neither could the paparazzi find any rumors about him. Did he have a fetish for such a woman? If it was indeed true, then Emma had landed herself a good deal, and she'd be heading for fame and fortune soon, would she not? God, this is big news. One had to understand that Stephen Lewis could get his hands on any woman he desired. Even Semika was mistaken, and her eyes instantly burned with wrath. She did not believe. Emma was also shocked by everyone's suspicion. They realized that it was Sylvester? God, this was a big wig she could not afford to offend. Just as everyone was second-guessing each other, leisure footsteps were heard from nearby. Stefan's tall and handsome figure appeared in their vision when they looked over. His charisma was evident as he strode over in his smart suit. The women swooned. Samika's heart also skipped a beat when she saw him, and she tried desperately to find any evidence of that alleged affair. Episode 92 I'll Destroy That Face of Yours Semika's heart also skipped a beat when she saw Stefan, and she tried desperately to detect any evidence of that alleged affair. She refused to believe that Stefan would have an illicit affair with a woman like Emma. Her gaze stopped at a coyly hidden hickey on his collarbone. It looked more like a bite mark than a love mark. A line of teeth imprint was visible, and it was obvious that it was there not too long ago. This was like a lightning strike for Samika. She stood rooted to the spot. A surge of excruciating pain welled up within her. She once more eyed Emma's body that was full of suggestive bite marks, which could not be concealed. Her grievance and fury were immeasurable. Stefan disliked any woman touching him. He would not permit any physical contact, even with her. So what did this woman have that would make him allow it? Oh, God. Is it really him? Does he have an affair with this bitch? Sh shut up. Can't you see that Grecia is present as well? Stefan is around too. Watch your mouth. What? Is Gracia engaged to Stefan only in name? Keep quiet. Don't you know that Semika also likes Stefan? Everyone was privately discussing with one another. Despite keeping their volume to the lowest, Emma still managed to catch what they were fervently talking about. Her eyes lit up with glee as an idea struck her. Is it possible that these women misunderstood the man in question as Stephen Lewis? Emma murmured. If she could ride on his coattails, she would not need to fear Charlie or even Sylvester, and would not even need Edward at all. Besides, Stefan would not waste his time clarifying such a small matter, right? This was just the right opportunity for Emma. She straightened her back as she plodded along. She then suddenly and silently slipped away from Edward's arms. Stefan emotionally swept his eyes across the crowd as he walked toward the elevator doors. 
It was at this moment that a shadow flew by and accidentally fell into his arms. This was Emma. She made it look as if she had tripped over something and caused her to stumble in his arms. He did not bother to look at her and just pushed her away with an ominous expression. She looked up and was taken aback by his chilly expression. She cried out to him, Sorry, Mr. Lewis. I, I haven't said anything. Please don't be mad. Haven't said anything? Is it true between them, then? Everyone was guessing again. Her words obviously had a hidden meaning. His eyes had turned hard and cold by then. He did not know what game she was playing, but he hated conniving women. The rest were gasping in shock at this, especially Semita. Her face was sullen from fury, and her eyes were filled with deep loathing. She would have torn Emma apart if there were no people around them. Gracia's face looked even more terrible. She did not know what the girl was up to, but the action was enough to infuriate her. Does this shameless rookie have any respect for my title as Gracia Lewis? Stefan apathetically took out a handkerchief and wiped himself vigorously before pushing away her hand. How filthy. She stood, stunned and embarrassed. This man was more arrogant and crueler than rumored. Sorry. She walked up and tried to clean him. Don't touch me. You are filthy. He truly threw his handkerchief at her. Daddy! Daddy! Sam ran to the man and asked gloomily, When will the gala start? His face softened a little as he looked at his son. Gently taking his small hand in his, he replied, Right away. I want to drink grape juice. Okay. He never denied any request of Sam. The love he had for his son was beyond words. Only after witnessing the scene did Gracia smile. She stepped forward to lock arms with him. Stefan, the gala is about to begin. Stefan had no change in expression, and the trio slowly entered the elevator. Samika wanted to follow, but retreated at the stare Gracia gave when the latter turned around. Her heart and soul were shaken by it. She clearly got scared by her menacing look. She only regained her composure after the elevator doors were firmly shut. Emma, was it really Mr. Lewis? Edward's voice came from behind. He fixed his eyes onto her and asked in desperation, Was it really Mr. Lewis? I... I'm not telling you. She snobbed meekly. I don't know anything. Don't ask me anything now. Bitch. Samika could no longer repress the raging fire in her heart and eventually ran up to her. She managed to clutch her hair at once and pulled it with all her might. Bitch. A lowly bitch. Smack. A resounding slap was heard, and Emma's cheeks immediately swelled, leaving behind a palm imprint. Everyone around was shocked, speechless. Edward did not bear to see this, but he did not dare to step out. Offending her meant offending Foxcom Entertainment. He was not stupid to that extent. Who are you? When did you hit me? Emma glared at her with tears all over her face. She could not fathom where this woman had come from and why she had hit her. Who am I? You don't have the right to ask me that. I hate bitches like you, you vixen. Samika was aflame with rage. She slapped her repeatedly without giving her a chance to speak. <laughs> Seeing this, Christina spun around and spoke to the crowd. Everyone scatter! Miss Semika isn't happy today. Let's head back to the event hall. The gala's about to start. Yes. Where are we all gathered here? No eyes for the situation, Claire added. The crowd cleared out right away. Emma felt as if she had fallen into an ice cellar when she saw this. Semika's livid face was enlarged before her. You're Emma Thames, right? Why are you this despicable? Have you not seen a man before that you don't know whom you can and cannot touch? Emma bolstered her courage and threatened. Don't go too far. I will get you for this. Don't you know who I am? 
I don't care who you are, but do you know who I am? Samika countered, and then shoved her toward the stairwell, furiously aiming her kicks at her chest. It had been ages since Samika had any form of training in martial arts. The strength in her legs remained formidable. Emma suffered from her vicious kicks and nearly coughed up blood. <laughs> Stop kicking! I... I won't do it again! She spoke incoherently. She did not have the strength to fight an opponent like her. Is there a use for pleading now? You ran around hooking up with men left and right with that face of yours, right? She squatted before her, took out a brow knife from her leather pouch, and then used it to apathetically threaten her into a corner. I'll destroy that face of yours for good. Let's see how you can still go hooking up with men. No. Emma's heart-wrenching cries echoed throughout the entire building. Episode 93, The Tear of Roses Monica slowly opened her heavy-lidded eyes. The room was already in order at this point. She blinked her eyes lethargically, and her vision gradually regained its focus and clarity. A glamorous ceiling was the first thing that entered her sight. She slowly shifted her eyes to her side. The bed was empty, save for her in this extremely spacious presidential suite. Her body unbelievably ached all over, and she had a splitting headache, which felt as if her brain were going to explode the moment she opened her eyes. She sat up in bed while holding her forehead. She wearily leaned on the headboard with lifeless and vacant eyes. After an eerie silence, she thought of something and hastily threw back the clean covers. She glanced at her body, and saw that it was now covered with a fresh bathrobe. Seeing her flesh totally free of any body fluid, she felt refreshed. She was shocked to see her body entirely covered with eye-catching purple hickeys, which interlaced with one another. She recalled every scene of their earlier intimacy, and her face instantly became scalding hot. Miss Thames, you're finally awake. A somewhat familiar voice sounded nearby. Astonished, she looked at the voice's origin and saw a grinning Zoe and a group of waiters lining up one side of the room. You? Why are you here? Under Mr. Lewis's orders, he replied and then asked kindly, Miss Thames, is your body all right? Hints of awkwardness could not be hidden from his words. It was extremely embarrassing to have other people see her in the state. She had never felt this humiliated before. Mr. Lewis has instructed me to send you home to rest if you're feeling tired, he said. She was secretly glad that the man was at least thoughtful. He had specially instructed people to prepare a set of comfortable clothes for her and to drop her home if she was not feeling well. No need. Someone is still waiting for me. She pursed her lips when she thought of Martin and loneliness flickered in her eyes. Zoe was dazed for a moment, before he said with a smile, I understand. Then, if you'll excuse me, I'd like to request you to step down from the bed so that I can help you with your clothes. Thank you. Monica got out of the bed and sat in front of the dressing mirror. Shock flashed across her eyes once she caught sight of the rose-colored gown on the tray. Gown? Isn't that... The treasure of Armani. Zoe explained. Mr. Lewis said that only you were a perfect fit for this gown. Then why did he... She was about to continue, but her voice hitched at her throat. That man was always difficult to decipher. He had clearly and resolutely ordered her to take off this gown earlier at Armani. The man's thought was impossible to grasp, just like finding a needle at the bottom of the sea. Zoe was a professional stylist. Combined with Monica's naturally beautiful face, which required little to no touch-up, an exquisite appearance, like a painting, appeared in the mirror in a jiffy. Earrings, headwear, gown, hairdo, and high heels. Dressing up a woman was always a huge undertaking. Half an hour later, Monica stood in front of the dressing mirror, 
and looked at the beautiful woman in it. It was in an elegant, silky red gown with a matching shawl around her shoulders. Her perfect figure was made apparent. She flawlessly depicted what was elegant and charming. Zoe walked up to her and revealed an exquisite jewelry case. In it, silently sat a refined ruby necklace. At that moment, the entire room seemed to sparkle. The necklace was inlaid with nothing except for a brilliant ruby. The dazzling ruby, the color of pigeon's blood, appeared to be an accumulation of actual blood. It was sparkling and magnificent and gave off a fascinating glow. It looked like a flame ablaze in the night sky, and it looked like flowing blood as well. It was strikingly vibrant. The moonlight reflected the beautiful hexagram on the ruby. She was slightly startled. So beautiful. Rumors had it that rubies were extremely rare. There were only a few of them in this world, so they were seldom seen. Of this rarity, the pigeon's blood ruby was the most precious. And this is? This necklace is called the Tear of Roses, and it is the only piece in existence. Pausing for a moment, Zoe then slowly informed... This is Mr. Lewis's prized possession. Prized possession? She arched an eyebrow in surprise and questioned, Then why did Stefan give this to me? Stefan? She actually called him by his name. Zoe was astonished and looked at her as if she were an alien. Monica was just too unique to be true. No one, including the elites in the capital, dared to call Stefan directly by his name. Everyone would respectfully address him as Mr. Lewis. Even then, this term was reserved for a select few. Most people would address him as Mr. Lewis. This tear of roses was one of the kind. It was his personal keepsake and held great importance to the man. So Zoe was surprised when he had him handed over to Monica for use at this night's gala. Did it mean that this woman had an exceptional place in his heart? He was not being calculative here. However, if she was Lewis's woman, Gracia, he naturally had to serve her with extra care. She was not someone to be offended. Fortunately, Monica was easy to get along with. She was elegant and humble. Compared to most of the big stars he had served before, she was much friendlier. Miss Dames, you are really different from the rest when you call Mr. Lewis by his name. Zoe chuckled admiringly. Resigned, she commented, He's not a king, and we're not in the feudal age. Why can't we address him by his name? Just who is this Stefan? And why is everybody, including those in power in the capital, so afraid of him? Zoe smilingly said, Ha huh. Miss Thames, do you know how powerful Mr. Stefan Lewis is with his family assets? Common folks like us have no idea. He proceeded to put on his gloves as he said this, and then carefully held the precious necklace in his hands. Miss Thames, this necklace goes with your outfit perfectly. Please don't move when I put it on you. I don't want this thing. I don't. She firmly rejected, recalling that the man was her nightmare. Miss Thames, please let me do my job. My task is to make you look perfect for this gala. I've been instructed that nothing goes wrong with your outfit and jewelry, otherwise I would lose my job. He desperately tried to persuade into cooperating. All right. She raised her hands and gave in. Perfect. Once he finished doing her makeup, Zoe stood before her for a final check. Seeing her in full glamour, he could not help but exclaim, Oh, God. James... You're simply the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Oh, thank you. I'm flattered. She blushed as she looked at her reflection in the mirror. Martin had keen foresight when he realized that this stunning gown would look exceptional on her, with her ethereal beauty. His gaze fell on the necklace on her neck. The pigeon's blood ruby complimented her snow-white skin as it seductively sparkled and shone under the moon's illumination. It's absolutely beautiful, Miss Thames. The gala dinner is about to begin. Let me show you the way. He slowly opened the door for her 
and she carefully made her way out of the room while holding the hemline of her gown. She bumped into Martin, who was waiting outside. She was startled to see him, and a flush of embarrassment soon spread across her face. He was momentarily stunned by her glamorous appearance, but quickly saw fatigue in her bloodshot eyes. Pain in his heart for her seemed to grow by the minute. Monica! Episode 9-4 Mommy is like a fairy. Monica! Why are you here? She mumbled softly before he could continue speaking. How can I leave you alone? I'm worried about you. She hung her head miserably. If it were like before, she could be his partner and openly hold his arm while receiving the artist's and media's questioning looks without qualms. Right now, however, she felt that there was suddenly a chasm separating them. He saw her dejection and went quiet as well. The room turned cold with her silence. A century seemed to have passed before the man walked up to the lady, and like a true gentleman, proffered his palm to her with his head bowed. Beautiful lady, are you willing to be my partner? She glanced at him in surprise, and then slowly put her hand on his. I'm willing. Both smiled at each other. A large chandelier hung in the center of a magnificent dining hall and illuminated the dance floor with its brilliant crystal lights. Andres looked around curiously, but his eyes were full of disappointment. Is this where my mommy is going to attend the gala? Yes, Mr. Thames, it's here. Do you want me to bring you to a room for a respite? No. In an elegant balcony on the second floor, Andres, who was casually sitting on Frederick's lap, sipped the bobbling cola through the straw and roamed his eyes around. A few major shareholders of Lego Holdings were also invited to this gala hosted by Foxcom Entertainment. Frederick, as a chief board member, was naturally among those invited. Andres was not interested in such events, but he wanted to see his mother in her glamour, so he had Frederick arranged for him to be present, too. He was wearing an iron-pressed black bib over a simple white shirt with a matching cute bow tie. The round spectacles on his face made him look adorably dashing. He criticized the hotel's interior design. This style is outdated. His agent gingerly explained with cold sweat littering his forehead. Mr. Thames, this is the most prestigious hotel in North America. There is none comparable to this. The boy frowned without changing his critical tone. The style is too low class. There was a little commotion just as he spoke. He raised his brow, jumped down from his agent's lap, and ran toward the banister. With his head between the two banister beams, he stretched his neck to take a closer look. Claire, Christina, and other artists slowly entered the event hall. He frowned and pouted disappointingly, mumbling, Where's Mommy? Frederick had followed him to the barrister and knelt beside him, totally unaware of his inappropriate behavior on this grand occasion. Mr. Thames, your mommy hasn't come yet. Andres agreed. Yes, the most important person is always the last to enter. This is the biggest gala Foxcom Entertainment has ever organized. You can see so many first-rated stars and elites here. This company is truly influential. Hmm. <laughs> These people are plain and crass. They look dull the boy said with a pout. His agent looked at him furtively and did not comment. He knew that the boy only had eyes for his mother. In his heart, his mother was the most important. The reason Lego Holdings had branched out in the entertainment industry by heavily investing in the upcoming The Forbidden Love movie was this boy. Digging deeper, Andres only explained briefly, My mommy is the female lead in this film. No one on the set is allowed to bully her. The production team initially had many considerations for the movie's female lead role. James Scott, Juan and Monica, and supporters of Claire and Pamela, would unfortunately not give up. Pamela especially had the support of Sylvester, and it was hard for the assistant directors to turn down this bigwit. They did not want to offend him. 
The role was eventually given to Monica after many tussles. One could only imagine the cat fights that had happened in the process. As the biggest investor, Lego Holdings had the final say in that lead role. And since they chose Monica, not even Sylvester could interfere in that decision. James was obviously very happy with this outcome. The fighting thus ended with that. Frederick was astonished at the extent of the boy's love for his mother. He had seen filial children, but he had not encountered anyone like Andres before. He was a mommy demon protector. This boy is the new century model mommy's boy. When he led Andres into the venue earlier, a few stars found him handsome and adorable and went up to play with him. The little lad did not have the patience to mingle with them, but they were so enchanted by his cuteness that they refused to leave. He eventually indulged them with a typical childlike innocence, showering them with praises. Sister, you're so beautiful. You look better in person than on TV. His warm and loving smile could melt anyone's heart. Once he turned around, though, he reverted to his cynical self. He commented with a snort, Are they trying to suffocate us with their deadly perfume? Their makeup is so ugly that they can't even match up to my mommy's one finger. At one side, Frederick was breaking out in a cold sweat. He gave him a sudden instruction. Frederick, take a few beautiful photos of my mommy when she appears later. Yes, I understand. He accepted the task. However, almost immediately, the boy cast doubt on his ability. How's your photography skills? To this, he replied, uh, I should be considered as better than an amateur. That satisfied Andres as he went. Good. His eyes then revealed a rare moment of loving gentleness. Photos must turn out beautiful. Make her like a fairy. But... His tone turned acerbic as he warned. If the photos don't turn out beautifully, I'll deduct a month's worth of your salary. Mr. Thames, he winced anxiously. Isn't he making things difficult for me? The little lad coldly continued. If she looks uglier than other women in the pictures, you can forget about your annual bonus too. Mr. Thames, he gave a forlorn cry. He was about to protest when he saw Andres tensing as he locked his gaze onto something in the distance. He followed suit and was equally alarmed by what he saw. There was a loud commotion at the center of the hall. Episode 95 The Son's Affirmation of His Father Frederick gave a forlorn cry. He was about to protest when he saw Andres tensing as he locked his gaze onto something in the distance. He followed suit and was equally alarmed by what he saw. There was a loud commotion at the center of the hall. In the crowd, Stefan could be seen holding Sam as he walked toward the seat of honor. The man was straight-backed and lean. He had a handsome, chiseled face, a pair of penetrating eyes, which was currently scanning the hall and a high nose bridge. These attributes, coupled with his aloofness and coldness, which would only disappear when he looked at his son, accentuated his nobility. With soft hair, a beautiful suit, and a haughty look, Sam was a small aristocrat in his father's arms. The father and son were indeed cast in the same mold with their similar look and expression. Camera flashes fired rapidly the moment the duo appeared at the venue, causing the hall to become as bright as daylight. Stefan hardly appeared in the news, except in high-end financial publications. Sam was even more seldom seen. Not one of his pictures had made it to any media outlets before. The Lewis family, or more appropriately, the Lewis group, held great influence, not just in the capital, but also across the country. This family had always been secretive, and the reason why this gala was so different from those held in the past was that Stefan, as Lewis Group's heir, would officially be appearing before the media for the first time. Gracia, who was also dressed for the occasion, proudly walked beside him 
and he flung onto his arm in a silent declaration of power. As the future mistress of the Lewis group, she was hated and envied by many socialites and elites. Once she is married into the Lewis family, she would be entitled to a lifetime of fame and fortune. The nearby Semica was loathingly watching the scene. She was green with envy and clenched her fists in sheer frustration. Zine also stung Andres, inflicted a disdainful look at the three, especially at the impressive man in the middle. This was his daddy, Stephen Lewis. His tensed face relaxed a little. From a superficial perspective, he was happy with how his father looked. A child would always hold their father in high regard. In a son's eyes, his father should be steady and strong, irreplaceable by any man. Putting aside all the complex emotions he felt toward his father, Stefan's kingly presence and charisma had affirmed the image of the imaginary father in his heart. The little lad sneered evilly. He's not bad. Oh, what do you mean? His agent asked in surprise. He held his head proudly before replying. A man who has me as his offspring is definitely made of good stuff. His tyranny perfectly resembled his father's regal haughtiness. Still, is that child really my brother? He pondered as he stroked his chin. Frederick, do you think that kiddo looks like me? He asked resentfully as he eyed the cold and proud boy sitting on his father's lap. That kiddo? Mr. Thames, you're a kiddo too. Frederick solemnly studied the two for a while and with beads of sweat littering his forehead once more, answered, You two look alike. In fact, very alike. They were twins in the first place. Their eyes were especially identical. The only difference was their aura. Sam, although childlike, tended to look serious and haughty, which fitted his identity as a rich man's son. He was detached and not easy to get close to. Frederick was muttering to himself at this juncture. He lacks maternal love, after all. Andres asked with a raised brow in return. Does that mean that I lack paternal love? Even without your father, Andres has managed to grow strong and steady. Frederick had other thoughts in his mind, though. It isn't actually strong and steady, but abnormal growth. Instead, a genetic anomaly, to be precise. He has a super brain and is already so scheming at this tender age. Andres frowned and looked concerned. I'm just worried that, because he's been deprived of motherly love at such a young age, he'll develop psychological abnormality. Not to worry, Miss Thames. Huh. No one can be as psychologically abnormal as you. You have a genetic anomaly. Sam should be the normal one. Frederick, what are you thinking about? Andres turned around and gave him a look. He might only be six years old, but his observation skill was exceptionally sharp and alert. He could tell what the other party was thinking of with just a glance. Frederick stammered. It's, uh, it's nothing important. I'm just thinking that you are really concerned for your brother. I am concerned for him? Andres raised his brow in half jest as he forlornly shook his head. Don't be mistaken, Frederick. I don't feel much for this father and brother of mine. The listener was stunned momentarily. Why do I want to acknowledge them? His voice trembled slightly, and he gripped the railing so tightly that his knuckles turned white. This unusual behavior of Andre caused him to worry. From what he knew, this little lad had always been calm and collected, and before his mother, he was innocent and childlike looking after her without complaints. No matter how challenging an obstacle might be, he was always that warm and kind Andy. He was his mother's support at her weakest point in life. However, upon removing all those visages, Andres was just a lonely boy standing alone at an obsolete corner. The child's loneliness affected the adult so much that he began to ache for him. Mr. Thames, what do you mean by your words? The warm and elegant smile had been eradicated from Andre's face. His face turned wan as he pursed his lips. 
He seemed to be struggling to keep his pain in check. Blood ties are useless stuff. Why should I call a stranger daddy and a child brother when they haven't done anything for me in these past six years? Why should I care for them? Frederick, who could no longer hold off the aching pain, walked up to the boy and held him tightly. Andres regained his composure thereafter and quietly went on. Frederick, my stupid mommy is really useless, isn't she? She's always being bullied and always giving in. No matter how heavy the grievances she faces, she's always smiling when she's at home. She wants to be the invincible mother before me. Isn't that stupid? Your mommy loves you dearly. She's willing to give in for your sake. Yes, you're right, stupid mommy. Andres' eyes looked distant and hollow as his thoughts dwelled on his nightmarish days. For as long as he could remember, he was a child without a father. Episode 96 Taking Everyone's Breath Away Andres was not bothered at first by the absence of a father figure. His father only existed in his mind. His mother, on the other hand, was very much real and had been by his side, loving and indulging him. Children were sensitive, so even if the memories were hazy, they could still consciously feel their parents' love for them. Growing up in a single-parent household, he inadvertently invited gossip. His mother had him when she was still studying, and news of her illegitimate child somehow spread through the school like wildfire. Many took this chance to slander her. The girls in school, who were jealous of her, ganged up on her and petitioned for her dismissal. His mother was suspended from school for half a year because of this. After much persuasion by Matthew, the principal unwillingly agreed to let her stay, but she lost the chance to study further. Getting older, Andres craved for his father. He had seen his classmates with their loving parents in kindergarten and was envious of them for having both their father and mother. That was when he realized the significance of having a man to hold up a family. If there was no man in it, the household would be despised. A pair of single mother, an illegitimate child, was always getting bullied. He could not forget the shame and despise he had to endure when he was younger. Oftentimes, his mother would sit by his bed and cry her regrets of keeping him by her side while he pretended to be fast asleep. If I hadn't selfishly taken you away back then, you would not be suffering like this and would have a happy life instead. With his eyes shut, he felt droplets of tears falling cold on his face. She's been enduring all the grievances in silence just to protect me. She thought she can fool me, but I know everything. He took a deep breath. His eyes revealed pain and resolve that were unusual for his age. Mommy is not strong, so I'll be strong for her. This household doesn't have a man, so I'll be one. He gazed up at Frederick as he was saying this and saw the latter looking at him wretchedly, deep in tears. Andres was taken aback. Frederick, why are you crying? Mr. Thames... You had such a terrible experience. I didn't expect. He turned teary-eyed again as he replied. He gave a disdainful look at his agent. How can a grown-up man cry so much? It's embarrassing. Frederick was dumbfounded. Mr. Thames, I feel sorry for you. Andres coolly replied. If you really feel sorry, make sure you take the best pictures of my mommy when she comes out later. How? Andres turned around and looked annoyingly at Sam with his perfect side profile. It seems that I can't bear to share my mommy with another child, he commented resignedly. His mother was his and his alone. He was unwilling to share her love with anyone, not even his father or his twin brother. No one. Inside the dining hall, the camera flashes would not relent. Sam was blinded by the glaring lights. They were hurting his eyes too much. He reached his little hands to rub his eyes. His father caught his movement 
and immediately signal the assistant to restrain the desperate media reporters. No more pictures. Daddy! Sam suddenly rubbed his chest, his brows forming a deep crease. My chest is a little stuffy. What's wrong? There was slight distress on Stefan's face. Why is your chest stuffy again? Sam shook his head in confusion. Acting coy, he pouted and answered, I don't know. It's just stuffy. Really stuffy and aching. It's awful. He caressed his son's small head. At that moment, there was another commotion at the entrance. Oh, God! So beautiful! A passionate crowd of media reporters subsequently congested the other end of the red carpet. Monica, wearing an elegant and attractive smile, had her arm linked with Martin's as they gracefully entered. The moment they appeared in the spotlight, countless eyes filled with surprise, jealousy, disdain, and doubt cast on them from near and far. People specifically laid their eyes on her eye-catching and glamorous gown and that dazzling ruby necklace on her collarbone. Monica, in a luxurious red gown, was as beautiful as a stock of fresh tender rose. She was in possession of a delicate and lively face. When she stood together with Martin, they were admittedly extremely compatible. The man was all along a darling of the fashion industry. He had a tall frame and an attractive face. It did not matter which female star stood beside him. They always paled in comparison and had attention taken away from them. However, Monica was different from the others and that when she stood next to him, not only was she not overshadowed by his presence, she was even more outstanding, and media reporters whispered to one another in excitement. I recognize her. Isn't she the one who came with Martin Lee? Yes, yes. She's Monica Thames. I got a hold of her name a while ago. I heard that she's a really talented rookie, and that her acting is superb. I heard that she's the chosen female lead of James Scott. You guys know about his eye for things. He's extremely stringent. Since she managed to get approval from James Scott, she should not be underestimated. Like surging waves. She clenched her fists tightly in disbelief and then gradually shifted her doubtful gaze onto Stefan. She would not mistake that ruby necklace. That was his personal keepsake and it was the only precious thing his mother had left behind for him. When she saw that necklace in the past, it was kept securely in a dainty and delicate crystal case which he carried around with him, never once leaving his side. She was not allowed to touch it. That necklace was priceless. Its value could hardly be gauged. And yet, he had actually casually given it to Monica? Fake! That necklace was definitely fake. A good quality counterfeit. Otherwise... How is it possible? Her complexion gradually lost its color. If the situation permitted it, she wanted to rush to her in large strides and shatter her bones into ashes. The gala had yet to commence, but the atmosphere had reached its zenith because of Martin and Monica. Glances were exchanged in the luxurious hall. Monica did not even notice the hatred radiating from Gracia's eyes. With her in the limelight tonight, those crazy camera flashes constantly shone on her, and it was uncertain how many rolls of films were being used up to capture her beauty. Episode 97 Stepping on You It was uncertain how many rolls of film were being used up to capture her beauty. Even Frederick, who was observing the scene from the second floor, was stunned. Andre stepped on his feet hard and asked sternly, Mr. Frederick, did you forget what I have tasked you to do? No. Frederick gave an immediate reaction. Perhaps he was overly shaken as he fumbled in excitement and nearly smashed the pricey DSLR on the ground. Stay calm. Andre stared at him exasperately as if he were mocking him from his inexperience in life. Boss, oh God, Miss Monica is so beautiful. So beautiful that time almost stopped. 
He was stunned to the core by her beauty and hurriedly held up the camera. He still did not forget to exclaim, Creator is such a mystical being. So beautiful. So beautiful. Of course. My mommy is precisely a fairy that has descended on Earth. With a knowing smile, Andres gazed at his mother lovingly. His eyes were filled with gentleness and warmth, nearly to the point of spoiling her waiting. Semika, wasn't that Monica? God, her gown is so beautiful. At the VIP seats, Stella exclaimed while looking over at Monica. She pushed away Semika, who was toasting to others in her disbelief. The latter turned around in frustration and snapped. What are you making the fuss of? Haven't you seen enough of this? Seriously? Do you still remember her? She's the rookie whom James has been pushing recently. The necklace around her neck is so pretty. It's actually a pigeon's blood ruby. Seneca was startled and then followed the direction Stella was looking. She could not help but be shocked as well. The necklace looked very familiar, as if she had seen it somewhere before. She went into deep thought. Her mind had a sudden recollection. Oh, thanks. Wasn't that... Piece of memory flashed across her eyes, and thereafter, a flame of jealousy was lit within her. This necklace was an orphan work, the only piece in the world. Thus, before this, she had only ever seen it in the hands of Stefan. She heard that the necklace was very meaningful to him, and he regarded it as his life. In the past, she had taken a great liking to this necklace, and pleaded him to part ways with it by giving it to her, but she accidentally angered him instead. At present, she did not dare show much interest in the necklace. Rumors had it that the Tear of Roses was the last orphan work of top Italian jewelry designer Cedric Mill in the last century. After its creation, many jewelry designers created numerous the Tear of Roses inspired exquisite diamond necklaces. Despite this, Pigeon's blood rubies were rare in the world, and the Tear of Roses could be said to be the Queen of Gems by the end of the last century. Why was it on her? There was increased suspicion in some of those eyes, but hidden beneath them was more of pure jealousy. She was about to take all the limelight at this gala. However, Monica took away her role and even her spotlight. Seneca laid her eyes on Martin and thought that this was even more unimaginable. She was actually his female partner? She had invited him to be her male partner for tonight. She was mercilessly rejected, saying that he already had a partner. She had been very disappointed. She consoled herself in the thought that his partner must be a world-famous female actress. In the end, it was Monica Thames, a rookie who had yet to debut... What was this? Her heart could hardly settle down. As Monica was about to walk past her, Semika sneakily stuck out her foot under Monica's gown. Unbeknown to her, the lady in red, perhaps due to her eyes, evil glint while plotting, was already on guard against her. Once bitten, twice shy, Monica saw how Claire had made a fool of Emma, so she was doubly observant of where she put her foot. Martin betted his reputation to pave an entry for her on this important occasion, so she treasured this chance very much and was adamant to be at her very best, whether in manner or expression. Semika's filthy expression informed her to keep an eye on her feet, and she did detect her ploy. As she glided past her with Martin, she pretended not to notice anything unusual. Her heels were seven inches high, and she waited for the appropriate opportunity to elevate one foot and skillfully bring a thin heel crashing down on top of the schemer's foot. Ah! Samika did not notice her opponent turn the tables on her, and her foot was mutilated as a result. Shouted with pain shooting through her body, Monica's stilettos were well formed with their thin, long heels, while Samika's were a pair of open-toed fish-mouth heels, which went well with her outfit tonight. Furthermore, Monica purposefully targeted her bare toe, 
Thus, it's no surprise that the recipient of her savage attack ended up with a cracked toenail. Samika dropped onto the floor from the sheer agony radiating from her broken toe. She had chosen a short gown and for some reason did not wear underwear. So when she fell backward in full view of the media, they wasted no time capturing images of her awful appearance in front of the guests. Without caring for her public image, Semika howled ostentatiously and loudly. Perspiration drenched her back as she became short of breath. Tears flowed freely on her cheeks. Monica! Following that loud scream, Stella jumped up and pointed an accusing finger at her. Did you do this on purpose? Monica was equally startled by this accident. She stood motionless, covering her lips in confusion and helplessness. A big commotion ensued as a result. Martin protectively pulled Monica to his back, as he warningly glared at Stella, asking, What do you mean? Stare was unusually caustic. In an instant, the atmosphere became charged with tension. Stella faltered at his coldness. She toned down her harsh words, but did not stop her complaint. This newbie was downright disrespectful when she stepped on Semika's foot. Martin was unfazed. Did Monica really step on Semika's foot? Did you see it for yourself? Stella admitted quietly, No. Meanwhile, Claire and Christina, who were standing at a far corner, did not show any intention of intervening. They did not want to be entangled in such murky situations with Stefan and Gracia being present. Yes, she's the one who stepped on my foot! Semita appeared wretched as she said, She's so vicious, Martin. I think I have a broken toe! Episode 98 Superb Intelligence Yes! She's the one who stepped on my foot! Samika appeared wretched as she said. She's so vicious! Martin, I think I have a broken toe! I, I, I didn't. Monica frantically tried to explain, appearing flustered and helpless. Inwardly, knowing how much force she had used in her attack earlier, she was sure she had broken Samika's toe. She may have been gentle and kind in the past, but it was only for Andre's sake. She wasn't a coward, and she had no intention of welcoming any bullies. Semika, she knew intuitively, was not someone to be trifled with. Yet it was the latter who had tried to play with her first. She was only returning her due justice, and nothing more. How about the time she stepped on someone else's toe? She was not the first one to do so tonight. Martin frowned. While he was not close to Semika, he knew of the latter's reputation as a spoiled and pampered princess. What she said could largely not be trusted. Hence, he did not believe her and merely dismissed her claim. I'll get someone to send you to the medical room. Martin, why are you so protective of her? This bitch did it on purpose! Stefan, meanwhile, was staring at Monica with furrowed brows. He had been unhappy since her arrival. Despite the fact that he assumed she would know her position by now, she continued to appear in public with Martin. Concurrently, Sam, who was standing by his side, was wearing the same expression. He had a vantage point of where Semika had fallen. Since Monica's arrival, he had focused all his attention on her. Just like his father, he was unhappy that the pretty sister Monica was by another man's side. However, what followed next stumped this young boy. Stemica actually stuck out her foot to trip the pretty sister. He saw and could not stop it in time. He did not expect the event to unfold like this. The commotion downstairs was clearly seen from the second floor. Andres only heard Semika's hollering an unreasonable accusation on his mother. His mother was at a disadvantage and he was truly worried and angry. How dare that woman to bully my mommy? Frederick, who is she? Frederick could only stammer. I, I don't know. Haven't you done your homework before coming here? 
None of the stars whom I like belongs to Foxcom Entertainment, he explained in a sorry tone. Looking rueful, Frederick continued, I'll make sure to do a thorough investigation after this gala. Andres leaned on the banister and took another look before he decided anxiously, No, this won't do. I'm going down. He quickly restrained the boy by scooping him into his arms. Please, sir. Please stay calm. You can't go down there. Your identity can't be exposed yet. No. Pretty sister didn't step on you. Just as he was fidgeting over his mother, a young and naive voice was heard from below. Dark-faced, he turned toward that voice and saw Sam looking unhappily at Semika. Pretty sister was doing fine, but you just had to put your foot out to trip her. It's your fault. Andres looked more irked when he heard this. Pretty sister? That boy actually called his biological mother Pretty Sister? That really threw him off. His lips uncontrollably twitched on his usually calm face. Then, going by this logic, what should he address me? A mental image of Sam calling him uncle in his naive and tender voice appeared before him. Andres was visibly shaken by this imagery. He really despised this stupid brother of his. However, he despised their father, Stefan, even more. He could not understand. Why did this brother only have this superb level of intelligence despite sharing the same genes? From a certain perspective, Andres could consider himself as their household's tiller, holding up the intelligent Koshians among the four. He paused and corrected himself harshly. What family of four am I thinking of? I'm not about to acknowledge this father and brother. In his family, there was only his mommy and him. The rest could not be counted. Semika was unprepared for Sam's comment. Her face turned dark as she shamefacedly gave a dry laugh. Inwardly, she was cursing the child for speaking out of nowhere. She would have given it to him if he was someone else's kid. Unfortunately, he was the son of Stephen Lewis, Sam Lewis. Standing behind the boy was the love of her life, Stefan, so she had to treat this child gently no matter what. The Lewis family was known for doting on him. She might need to get along with him when she married into the Lewis family. She had to get him to be on her side, or he might become the stumbling block to her plans of marrying into the Lewis family. Hence, she smilingly told him as she bore the pain on her foot, Sam! Baby boy, you must have been mistaken. I won't do such a despicable thing. He disdainfully looked at her and continued in his tender voice. Daddy has taught me to be a gentleman since young. I have to be responsible for my action. I didn't lie. You did put out your foot to trip the pretty sister. Andres almost fell over after hearing his brother's juvenile accusations. He had assumed that his twin would have the same elite genes as him, yet his speech was only at the level of kindergarten, despite his smart and aloof look. He covered his face in silence. As for Frederick, who was standing beside him, was eagerly nodding his head. That's the behavior a six-year-old should have. Mr. Thames, your IQ and EQ are really too abnormal. Sam's words had sparked a debate amongst the guests. The child doesn't lie. Plus, he's from the important Lewis family. He must have had a strict upbringing. As for Sam, he can't lie. That's right. I also feel that Semika is aiming at Monica. Women are prone to jealousy. Monica has hoarded the limelight tonight, and many are unhappy with that. I'm sure there are some who want to put her in an awkward position. There's always pressure on a newbie, especially for someone like her who has no track record. It's natural for her to be ostracized. I feel sorry for her. Samatha was close to tears again, this time prompted by anger. She said, I did not. Oh, really? There's video surveillance over there. Sam pointed to the video surveillance at the side and continued, I think it is facing your direction. We can replay the scene and find out the truth then. Episode 99, End of a Plausible Career in the Entertainment Industry 
Oh, really? There's a video surveillance over there. Sam pointed to the video surveillance at the side and continued. I think it is facing your direction. We can replay the scene and find out the truth then. The little lad then pointed a finger at Samika and acting mysterious, continued. The truth will prevail. He looked smug after saying this. Apparently, he was feeling pleased with himself for coming up with such a cool statement. Everyone went silent. Monica was flabbergasted and tickled at the same time. She was not prepared for Sam's cheeky remark. Likewise, Stefan was unable to keep his usual calmness. His stern face had a rarely seen slight smile in it. On the second floor, Andres was fossilized by what he had just heard. Is my brother trying to be funny? Martin sniffled and then chuckled uncontrollably. He was amused by Sam's interesting look. <laughs> the guests were also tickled by this cute child's antics. His biological mother, who was in the crowd, looked at him with complex emotions. She wanted to laugh, but could not. Was her child trying to shield her earlier? She did not expect it at all. The mother-son pair had not seen each other since he was born. Despite that, there seemed to fetter that bound them. The saying, blood is thicker than water, was true indeed. Their bond could not be easily erased. Is this a connection? Did he address me earlier? Could he sister? She could not stifle the chuckle this time. When she first met this child, he looked aloof and detached. He gave her the same impression as his father, someone whom no one could draw near. Yet this child just showed her an adorable side tonight. Andres and this child were twins, but their temperaments were unlike. Andres was gentle, naive, idealistic, and warm. Sometimes he would be surprisingly mature and adult-like which made him very dependable. Sam seemed to take after his father. He held a cool and deep demeanor, yet he could exude such a rare display of loveliness, too. He should be a smart boy, right? One of her biggest regrets was missing out on the first six years of her other child's life. The tense atmosphere had somewhat relaxed. Chuckling Martin signaled the assistant by his side with a look. The assistant took the hint and approached Samika, intending to bring her to the medical room. She was uncooperative at first, but eventually had to succumb to the assistant's skillful persuasion. Miss Samika Johnson, I believe you don't want to bring unwanted attention to yourself now. That surveillance camera is facing your direction, and the earlier event should have been recorded by it clearly. Unfortunately, I've caught sight of what you did too. Martin is creating a diversion for you now so I highly recommend that you take this chance to get out of this situation. The assistant paused and then asked, Do you really want to embarrass yourself in front of the media? I... Samika was speechless for a while before she tried one last ditch. I don't like the attention she's receiving from everyone. Why is the world revolving around her? Miss Monica is Mr. Martin's partner in this gala. He holds her in high esteem, but you're kicking up a fuss over here. Are you trying to create trouble for him? I have nothing against Martin. Martin is creating a chance for you to back off now, for the sake of your father as well. Please don't do this again next time. Sorry. She relented and apologized, allowing the assistant to help her to the medical room. This finally put an end to the drama. The gala thus peacefully started. As Laura Jones, who was Martin's assistant, helped Seneca into the medical room, she saw a pool of blood on the bed next to the door. An unconscious lady was lying in the bed inside the room. She was taken aback by the horrifying scene. Gosh, what happened to this woman? Semika knew very well who the person was. It was her doing that Emma ended up in this sorry state after all. For a woman, such a fate would mean the end of a plausible career in the entertainment industry. This was a dinner that destroyed her bright future. Samika, in a fit of anger, was vicious in her earlier attacks. She was a little alarmed and a little regretful when she saw Emma again in the medical room. Only now did she realize how fiendish she had been. 
seeing the poor woman when she opened the door to the medical room. She felt somewhat guilty. She did not want to hurt anyone, but this woman was bitchy at the time and provoked her into losing her sensibility. She had already called her father, who would be sending someone to settle this matter soon. To prevent this matter from getting out to the public, her family was prepared to cover up with a few million in compensation. This should satisfy the victim and their family, and suppress any further issues from cropping up. If Emma did not give up, she would just make use of a scapegoat, and that should settle the matter as well. It was easy and simple to settle someone without power and status. She turned toward Laura and said, Can I trouble you to get me an ambulance? This place is repulsive. I can't stay here long. All right. The assistant did not suspect anything fishy with the request and stepped out of the room to call for an ambulance. Samika's request suited her intention, too. She was pretty sure that the former had broken a toe, which would need medical attention. After all, her toe was stepped on with a seven-inch sharp heel, when Semika saw that no one else was in the room anymore, she mustered her courage to walk up to where Emma was motionlessly lying. She gingerly shook the woman in the bed with the tip of her toe and frowned worriedly when there was no response. She remembered she had hit a few vital spots when she was teaching this woman a lesson. Could it be that she had died from her ferocious attack? She put out a finger to check for breathing and sighed in relief when she detected short, pulsating breaths from the nostrils. Bitch, don't blame me for being vicious. You brought this on yourself. She muttered and moved to pull back her finger, when a bloody hand suddenly grabbed her wrist in a vice-like grip. Samika gasped with fear in her eyes. The woman in the bed abruptly opened her bloodshot eyes. Episode 100 The Competition Inside the Dance Pool Let me go! It's a ghost! Samika, in panic mode, raised her hand and slapped Emma's face to pry herself loose. As she frantically limped and pulled herself toward the exit, she bumped head-on into Laura, who had returned after calling for an ambulance. The latter saw her frightened look and asked in bewilderment, what happened? Quickly, send me to the hospital. Hurry! Laura found her behavior strange, but did not probe further. Some things were better left unknown. The castle-like retro dining hall, with its exquisite frescoes and hollow dome between carved beams, gave one the illusion of being in a lavish palace. Once the guests of honor finished giving their opening speeches, it was time for the dance, the soothing classical music pervaded the air of the spacious hall. After an eventful start, Christina and Claire learned to behave themselves. They were experienced actresses and knew the importance of doing the right thing at the right time, so they did not try to find faults with Monica again. James was late, though once he arrived, he was quickly surrounded by actresses with their curtsies and wine, hoping to get him to notice them. He had to expend much effort into returning their favor, which ended up spoiling his good mood. However, when he saw Martin gracefully approaching him with Monica, he was elated and could not stop praising Monica. Oh God, you look stunning tonight. The two producers and assistant directors that were standing behind him also lavished her with praises. Thank you for your thoughtfulness, Mr. Scott, Mr. White. Mr. William, how are you? She reciprocated with a smile and calmly asked. Miss Monica, you still remember our names? Mr. William was evidently surprised and pleased. You were present with Mr. White during the audition. And it is common courtesy to remember the name of the judges. Mr. White smilingly said, Mr. Scott, you have good taste. This newcomer is humble and polite. With her beauty and talents, she'll have a bright future ahead of her. Of course. When have I ever disappointed you with my choices? He asked back, looking smug. Martin was smiling too. Monica is a polite girl. This is what I like about her as well. This is what I like about her too. Her cheeks flushed red upon hearing that, 
for no apparent reason. That's right. This is praiseworthy indeed. Some newcomers are proud and rude just because they have a good background. Mr. White changed the subject suddenly. I have to warn you, Miss Monica, though. You must be mentally prepared for Mr. Scott. He can be very critical and demanding at times. Before Christina gained fame, when she debuted in his first film, he made her cry with his scolding. He is known as the demon director in this industry, and many starlets have been badly criticized by him in the past. Martin also shook his head, admitting ruefully, Yes, I've been scolded by him before, too. Oh? She was really surprised to hear that. Martin, your acting is consistently good. He could only smile wryly at that. Mr. White interjected with a chuckle. <laughs> that was when Martin was still relatively new in the show business. He missed a cue during filming, and he got it from Mr. Scott after that. James snorted. He should be thankful that he met me. That's why he's so popular now. Mr. Scott is demanding because he respects his career. It is necessary to be demanding to your actors in order to produce a good movie, she commented. The rest shared her opinion. Their look at one another indicated the approval of this newcomer. She was good. After exchanging pleasantries, Martin pulled Monica to one side and gently whispered to her ear, Monica, let's go dance. Sure, but I can't dance. I'm going to be clumsy. She was a little concerned. He blinked mysteriously at her. Why don't you trust your teacher here to teach you well? Without waiting for her reply, he took her hand and brought her to the center of the dance pool. And after giving her some basic instructions on posture and tempo, he held her waist and gently lifted one hand in readiness to start. She followed his guidance and did the same as she put one hand on his shoulder. They were the center of attention inside the dance hall. The man was handsome, and the lady was glamorous. Together, they were picture-perfect. This beautiful couple made the lavish surroundings dim in comparison. Sensing the concentrated attention on them, she instinctively retracted in fear. Martin? Don't worry. Just follow my tempo. At the VIP seat, Stefan, who was holding a wine glass, gazed coolly at the couple in the dance hall. His eyes gradually dimmed as his knuckles on the wine glass turned white. Sam, who was sitting beside him, was also staring at the same pair of dancers. He seemed to dislike the man somehow. He annoyingly crossed his arms. Unhappiness was written all over his little handsome face. Stefan, shall we dance? Gracia walked over to Stefan and asked, her hand resting lightly on his shoulder. Oh... He agreed after a quick thought. He took her hand and led her to the dance floor. The guest's attention was diverted to the new couple once they joined in the dancing too. Compared to Monica's clumsiness with her simple basic dance steps, the Lewis couple was elegant. As upper-class aristocrats, manners and dance etiquette were part and parcel of their early childhood education. Stefan, in his well-tailored and smart-looking suit, looked tall and elegant as he gracefully moved with the melodious music. His grace zoomed many in the audience. Oh God, Mr. Lewis is so cool. He's the elite of the elites, indeed. He dances so well. He has the face of a Greek god. How can anyone be so perfect? Oh, I'm so envious of the woman beside him. I want to dance with him too. <laughs> him dancing with you? Just who are you? Dream on! Monica could not help but be distracted when he appeared. She threw him a sidelong glance, her expression turning hazy and flighty. While she was looking at him, he was not doing the same. His side profile looked handsome and proud, almost untouchable. Without realizing it, she stepped on Martin's shoe tip. Oops! She cried out. Her face turned red from embarrassment as she apologetically looked at him and said, Sorry! It's painful, Monica. He raised his brow forlornly. Where are you looking? You must concentrate when you dance, or you'll miss your footing. She nodded absent-mindedly, no longer wanting to continue dancing. Her heart skipped a beat, 
had missed its rhythm when she saw Stefan. Her heart and mind had been robbed by him since he arrived on the dance floor. Thank you for listening. Please don't forget subscribe. See you on the next episodes.